A gene is a sequence of nucleotides that makes up a portion of a chromosome, which helps us biologically encode information and pass it between generations. The word gene designates an individual unit of this hereditary stuff, which is transmitted through reproduction. A meme is a cultural analog to a gene. It's, quote, an idea, behavior, or style that spreads from person to person within a culture, end quote. So just like genes, memes pass on information, and that information is encoded in rituals, jokes, speech, tropes in fiction, and the like. Also like genes, they mutate over time, self-replicate, and respond to selective pressures, causing them to evolve. The word meme and the concept behind it was coined by Richard Dawkins in his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene, in which he proposes shortening the Greek word my meme to just meme for the sake of concision. In the 90s, a field called memetics was born with the purpose of understanding how cultural information is transferred and spread and how it evolves over time. The basis of this field is that a meme is a unit of encoded information, in the same way that a gene is a unit of encoded information, that plays a role in human cultural evolution. Understanding this flavor of information transmission, then, seems prudent if we want to understand how our societies form, change, and diverge over time. Not everyone thinks that meme theory holds water. Some researchers and philosophers have called the idea, quote, pseudoscientific dogma, or, quote, nonsense. Others consider the idea of a meme to be a less successful ripoff of something else. The evolutionary biologist Ernst Mayer, for instance, sees meme as an unnecessary synonym for concept, while some prominent semiotic theorists have derided meme as a primitivized version of the semiotic concept of sign, which in the world of semiotics is, quote, something that can be interpreted as having a meaning, which is something other than itself, and which is therefore able to communicate information to the one interpreting or decoding the sign, end quote. To many people today, though, a meme is simply something interesting or funny or weird that they saw on the internet recently. The website Know Your Meme documents different species of internet memes, analyzing, cataloging, and explaining the immense variation found in very specific niches, from the classic I can has cheeseburger images, all the way to the contemporary, as of the day I'm recording this at least, Trump making funny faces while pretending to drive a truck meme. Some memes are politically motivated, meant to satirize and point out truth through comedy while others are simply bizarre, goofy, strange, or intentionally nonsensical. Some are meant for a very niche audience, with inside jokes only discernible to those who frequent the right forums or listen to the right podcast. Others are broad enough that your parents would understand them, even if they don't quite get why someone has taken the time to Photoshop and share an image of a Shiba Inu dog looking stuck up and appearing to say things like, wow, so amaze, much noble. The article I want to start from today is about memes, or rather it's about something really bad that happened that triggered the creation of memes. And it's about how these memes, in some ways, were the most prudent and effective way to respond to that really bad thing. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is a listener-supported show. A huge thanks to everyone who has helped contribute to the show in some way already. And if you have not, and if you are thinking of doing so, consider stopping by letsknowthings.com, clicking over to the contribute page, and choosing from the array of options that are there. Everything from contributing directly monetarily, to leaving a review up on iTunes, to sharing the show with a friend. 
I have a new book that is coming out very soon. That's coming out May 1st of 2017. It's available for pre-order as of the day that I'm releasing this episode. The book is called Becoming Who We Need to Be. The way I've been describing it to people who are familiar with my work is that it's the love child of this podcast, Let's Know Things, and my book, Considerations, which is an essay collection about practical philosophy, I guess you could say. So that is another option in terms of helping to contribute to the show and to my work in general. If you pop over to Amazon or wherever you get your ebooks, you can pre order a copy of Becoming Who We Need to Be. And that will also be available in paperback and audiobook on Audible come May 1st. You can also help support the show by checking out our sponsors. If you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, you'll get a free 30-day trial of Audible and a free audiobook of your choice. And if you go to hostgator.com slash LKT, you will receive a substantial discount that they provide to Let's Note Things listeners. So that's a great option if you're looking to start a blog, website or some other online project. All right, let's get back to the show. The article that I want to unspool today comes from the BBC website, and it's entitled, Londoners Share Images of Unity and Strength After Westminster Attack. And in addition to that article, I'll share some other articles that give details of the attack in question that is referred to in that first article. I'll share that in the show notes. But the basic details are on Wednesday, March 22nd, 2017, a man drove a rental car up onto the sidewalk on the Westminster Bridge in London. And this bridge is a big tourist attraction in the city. It crosses the Thames right next to the Westminster Palace grounds. So it's actually remarkable that there weren't more deaths and injuries, though the numbers are still striking. As of the day that I'm recording this, there have been four people confirmed killed, about 50 injured, and of those, 31 were taken to the hospital. Three of the injured remain in critical condition today. Now, some of these injuries were caused by panic, while others were the direct result of being hit by the car, as was the case with one woman who was hit and then thrown off the bridge into the Thames. Among the injured were three French children, two Romanians, four South Koreans, one German, one Pole, one Irish, one Chinese, one Italian, one American, and two Greeks. And as I said, this bridge is a fairly well-known tourist destination. It is right next to the very famous Big Ben. And after plowing through a crowd of people in his rental car, the person behind the wheel, who was later identified as a 52-year-old British man named Khalid Masood, ran into the Westminster Palace grounds where he stabbed a palace guard to death with a kitchen knife before being shot and killed by a police officer. Later that same day, a Birmingham neighborhood was shut down and seven arrests were made, along with another arrest that was made in London. All eight people who were arrested were suspected of having helped Masood plan or perpetrate the attack, though as of the day I'm recording this, all but three of those arrested have been released after questioning. The so-called Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attack, though it's worth mentioning that they kind of claim responsibility for any attacks that happen these days, even when there's little reason to believe that they had a hand in it, or if the only connection is that the killers who perpetrate the crime say that they're fans of the Islamic State. Masood was born as Adrian Russell Elms, and changed his name to Khalid Masood when he converted to Islam. He apparently had a history of violence and was, for a time, on MI5's radar. That's the British spy agency. And he worked for several years in Saudi Arabia as an English teacher. When combined with his other actions and the nature of his religious conversion, this is all apparently consistent with the radicalization process that has been seen in other faith-motivated terror attacks. So there's a chance that there was an actual ISIL connection, but it could still have been a lone wolf thing as well. This, like all attacks of this kind, is obviously horrible, and I cannot imagine how traumatic it must have been for those directly involved. 
and peripherally, too, how those who live and work in the area must now feel about their neighborhood. But what stuck with me about this story in particular is how it has been reported on and presented by the press, and the BBC in particular, which is the source for the story that we are unspooling today, has been pretty ardent about focusing on the British response to the attack rather than fixating on the attack or the attacker. And that response, in short, has been, keep calm and carry on. It probably should be noted that the keep calm and carry on signs that have become so popular of late are not an actual part of British history, or at least not to the degree that is often implied. They were produced during the Blitz in World War II by the State Propaganda Office, but they were hardly ever displayed in public. They produced a few million of these posters, but none of them really saw the light of day. And it wasn't until 2000 that they were produced and displayed on scale as part of a nostalgic British stiff upper lip sort of campaign. I believe it was part of a financial crisis thing that we will persevere through this financial crisis. From that point forward, the slogan and the style of the poster was replicated on a massive scale by a variety of companies, and it was henceforth implicitly part of the British World War II story, even though it didn't actually play a role in the war. But that same vibe that comes through in the Keep Calm and Carry On poster also comes through in the artworks and posters and memes that have been produced and shared since the Westminster Bridge attack. In just a few days, an image resplendent of the tube station labels, bearing the words, We are not afraid, became a widely shared online success. And another image showing simply drawn people of multiple ethnicities and religious affiliations standing against a background of a hand-drawn London skyline And bearing the words, London, what divides human beings is small and mean, what unites human beings is huge and wonderful, became immensely popular. Another visual that reached meme status was a series of photos featuring the handwritten signs that are displayed outside of London tube stations, usually bearing either quotes or information about closures and detours within the tube system. In the days following the attack, though, they featured meaningful quotes like, the flower that blooms in adversity is the rarest and most beautiful of them all, and side by side we stand together. These were presented along with social media account information and relevant hashtags like hashtag I am London and hashtag we are not afraid. This particular meme actually became so popular that people began to make their own fake whiteboard sign quotes showing the same signage that you would find outside a London tube station, but with their own computer-generated inspirational quotes over the top of them. And that, to me, is a huge component of the story of this event, or at least what sets it apart from other car-based terror attacks that have taken place around the world recently. I can't speak as to whether this is an accurate reflection of the feeling on the ground in London, but the story being told by British leadership and in the British press, especially the BBC, is that the British people are facing this tragedy with resolve and a stiff upper lip. They will go about their business and not allow this attack to terrorize them. They will not be disrupted. This is a stark contrast to the responses to similar attacks that have taken place elsewhere in recent years. The attack that took place in Nice, France, in July of 2016, involved a massive truck plowing through a Bastille Day crowd, which resulted in 86 deaths and 434 wounded. It was a much larger scale attack, certainly, but the details were otherwise similar, down to the attacker, the man driving the truck, who was also a resident of the country in which he launched the attack, and he was also killed by the police afterward. The consequence of the Nice attack was that the French president extended a state of emergency that had been in place since November the year before, when a trio of coordinated attacks hit Paris almost simultaneously, resulting in 130 deaths and 368 injuries. 
this state of emergency grants the executive branch of France special powers, including the ability to raid homes without going through the usual processes and channels, provided there's suspicion that the occupants might be involved with terrorist plots. There has been a great deal of outcry about this particular aspect of the state of emergency in France, as many French Muslims, especially those of African descent, have been targeted without any apparent cause beyond their religion and heritage. That said, the approximately 3,600 house raids that have taken place since the state of emergency went into effect have resulted in the seizure of more than 500 weapons. It also resulted in 400 arrests, which have led to a handful of judicial investigations so far. Meaning that this state of emergency and those special powers have led to a not insubstantial amount of arrests and presumably plots foiled and weapons seized, but it's also resulted in a whole lot of people who are not involved in anything nefarious being targeted as a part of police action. If that French response to terror sounds familiar, it may be because this state of emergency of theirs is similar in many ways to the American Patriot Act, which went into effect after the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon on September 11th, 2001. The full name of this act, by the way, is USA Patriot, which is an acronym for Uniting and Strengthening America by Providing Appropriate Tools Required to Intercept and Obstruct Terrorism Act of 2001. Someone in the U.S. Department of Acronyms almost certainly got a bonus for that one. This Patriot Act gave broad new powers to the executive branch of the United States, and is considered by many to mark the beginning of a new approach to foreign policy for the country, one that required the formation of entire new agencies and the development of novel modes of operation, including things that we tend to take for granted today like TSA checkpoints at airports and surveillance by the NSA. It was also the beginning of practices like indefinite detention for suspected terrorists and immigrants, the FBI being able to search phone records and financial records without a court order, and the expansion of the definition of terrorism for the purposes of deciding how to try and sentence a defendant. Things like the Patriot Act and ongoing, maybe perpetually ongoing, states of emergency can seem like prudent moves in the moment, only to feel like overblown, though perhaps politically prudent, moves once the smoke is cleared and everyone's had a chance to get over the emotional shock of what just happened. There are a lot of good arguments to be made for these types of additional powers in certain circumstances, but they also come treacherously close sometimes to overstepping the line between well-balanced democratic systems and something else entirely. And that is the whole point of terrorism, isn't it? To cause terror, to make us react frantically and emotionally, and to cause us to lash out and to act against our own declared interests and values. The direct consequences of the attacks, the injuries and the deaths, are intentional, but they are also very often committed primarily to cause secondary damage, secondary consequences, the clamping down on freedoms, the fear and discord between groups, the knee-jerk hair-trigger reprisals, and the fear and mistrust within and between the local population and their government. This is what differentiates terror attacks from just plain old attacks, the desire to cause terror, to cause fear and panic. We consider it to be something worth legislating differently because it's more of an assault on norms and values than on individuals. A white supremacist walking into a black church and killing nine people, as happened in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015, is intending not just to kill and injure people, but to make an entire group of people scared for their lives, to make them scared to go about their business as normal to make them scared to adhere to societal norms because they worry that another attack might take place. The increased usage of cars and trucks as weapons is partially the consequence of it becoming more difficult to acquire and carry weapons of the traditional sort, in some societies at least, 
But these types of attacks are also intended to make us fear everyday scenarios and objects. First, we learn to worry about getting into planes because they might be hijacked. Then we're taught to worry about going to church or mosque or a temple because consistent bomb threats have caused us to associate these locations with potential acts of violence. Now we have to worry about congregating in public spaces with other people. We have to be wary of strangers. We have to stay away from streets and crowds and holiday celebrations. Each step causes us to retreat societally into the arms of increased security. And this security comes at the expense of freedoms, sometimes small freedoms, sometimes very large, important ones. Being stopped and frisked has become a common feature of everyday life for some New Yorkers. Being scanned and patted down and having your possessions rummaged through at the airport has become such an integral part of travel that we barely think about it anymore. That numerous government agencies around the world are able to access our digital lives, our data, our communications, with ease and without falling on the wrong side of the law, typically, speaks volumes about how willing we've become to give up our freedoms in favor of perceived security. And though some of these moves might be prudent and effective, they are also victories for those who wish to cause havoc, to shake our societies in the first place. Because what do you do when your enemy is massively better funded and armed than you? You attack them asymmetrically. You kill them with a thousand paper cuts. You take apart their society piece by piece. The individual acts might be relatively small in scale. But in aggregate, entire chunks of society disappear every year. Freedoms are lost, norms are disrupted, fears are spread, and internal fractures are widened. And then one day you wake up and find that your country is banning laptops on airplanes, because there's a chance, maybe, potentially, that someone with ill intent could hide explosives inside their computer or tablet and detonate it at 30,000 feet. When everything is a potential weapon, what do you ban? At what point are the consequences of the ban more extreme and harmful than the threat they're meant to diffuse? Is it possible to create a perfect security infrastructure that could alleviate all possible threats, whether they stem from bombs or guns or rental cars and kitchen knife assaults? It's worth mentioning that the United Kingdom has one of the most sophisticated security state apparatuses in the world. The United States is known for high levels of surveillance and the doing of bad things in the name of increased security. But in the eyes of many experts, the UK has taken things even further in how it surveils its citizenry and trades away certain rights for increased perceived security. The Investigatory Powers Act 2016, often referred to as the Snoopers Charter was passed by the British House of Lords in November, giving police and spy agencies in the UK complete access to all internet browsing data from all people in the country. Which is to say, while there are circumstances in many countries, including the US, where government agencies can check in on what certain people are doing online in some situations, there are groups that track and push back on this. So they have to be careful and use these powers surgically. In the UK, that's no longer an issue. The floodgates are wide open, and police and intelligence agencies can look in on anyone, at any time, for any or no reason at all. The well-known whistleblower Edward Snowden said this about the Snoopers Charter after it passed. Quote, The UK has just legalized the most extreme surveillance in the history of Western democracy. It goes farther than many autocracies. End quote. The big question that I want to ask is this What is the most appropriate and reasonable response to terror attacks? Appropriate in that it suits the crime and hopefully prevents future instances of the same, and reasonable in that it doesn't strip away the very liberties that we are attempting to defend. On a personal level, these events all feel very tragic and horrible. They rile up all kinds of emotion and fear. We worry about the people who were killed and injured, and the families they left behind. We worry that something similar could happen to us. 
on our flight, at our mall, on our bus, in our nightclub or movie theater. We worry that this is just one of a new wave of attacks, and that we'll have to be constantly on guard, continuously vigilant, lest we become the next victim, the next statistic. We are flooded with fight-or-flight chemicals and can act irrationally as a result. Our individual responses in aggregate make up our societal responses to these acts. When we are emotional and thinking non-optimally, perceiving and responding through our lizard brains rather than our rational minds, we tend to favor heavily security, and in some cases vengeance, over other possible solutions. As a result, bombing the perceived enemy, or just bombing someone, anyone, in retaliation, makes us feel that we're at least doing something. We're not just sitting around being victimized, twiddling our thumbs like idiots. So we perhaps then act on less information than we would typically require to make such a decision. Maybe we go to war. Maybe we assassinate some people. Something that allows us to get some kind of result. Something we can report and feel good about. Maybe we pass laws that reduce our individual freedoms and which move us an inch closer to living in a police state. Because damn it, we're in a state of emergency. We can't just sit around and do nothing. We can't look weak, and we can't allow this insult to go unpunished. Nor can we leave our obviously weak borders and walls and defenses in the same sorry state they're apparently currently in. A counter-narrative to this perception, and one that's less popular and less likely to even get a hearing in the aftermath of an attack when we are all emotionally revved up, is this. Our defenses, as they stand today, are already pretty good. They're solid enough to filter out many of the conventional attacks we would otherwise need to worry about, and the vast majority of concerns are thereby cut off before they can become an issue. And the things that do make it through are aberrations. They're either the fraction of a percent of the traditional attacks that make it through our existing filters because unlikely things still happen, and there's no way to have perfect security, or they're new in some way, they're clever in some way, which keeps them off our radar just enough to work until we can account for them in the future. They take advantage of a current blind spot. And our blind spots are many, but we are pretty good at becoming more observant after we are targeted by those types of attacks. But how do you protect against someone with a rental car and a kitchen knife? How can you possibly keep anyone, any everyday citizen you walk past on the way to work, from becoming a serial killer if they choose to become one, just randomly? How do you keep tabs on all the possible reasons a person can have for killing other people? What system could possibly keep you, right now, from grabbing a knife and attacking the first person you see? That system, that mechanism for security, does not exist. And if it did, it probably wouldn't be a system that we would want to live with. At a certain point, the protections, The fail-safes, the retaliatory cycles, end up making life worse. They become like a medical treatment that's worse than the disease that they're meant to treat. At a certain point, we have to step back and ask whether we're pursuing the right kind of protections, and at the right intensity. And if we're not, we have to start asking what the alternatives might look like. There are a potentially unlimited number of reasons for people to attack other people. But statistically, domestic violence takes the cake. One in three women and one in four men will be physically victimized by their partner or a family member at some point in their lives, according to current data. Which is just nuts and sad, and a much larger issue than a lot of the other violence-related fears we are more inclined to worry about and spend money preventing. But the non-personal, terror-oriented attacks that occasionally slip past existing protective systems like the police and other basic public security features, seem to fit into two main groups. There are those who believe violence and terror will help them right an injustice or correct a perceived historical wrong. This group is populated by people who seek revenge or wish to change the dominant narrative about something. Maybe their ancestors were mistreated or their land was taken from them at some point. And then there are those who believe that violence and terror are justified means to an end in bringing about positive change. 
and that's positive according to their perception of the word, so this concept is a pretty broad one. Those who commit acts of terror in the name of their religion fall into this category, as do those who wish to install a new type of government, and who are willing to kill all members of the current government to make that happen, if need be. In some cases, the people who fall into this latter group decide to use violence to achieve their ends only after a great deal of thought, and perhaps even after a failure to achieve their goals through other means. Some of the people they recruit may be more predisposed toward violence, but those in charge often see it as a means to an end, rather than an end unto itself. According to Amy Zalman, the owner of the Strategic Narrative Institute, those are the two core rationales behind terrorism of all kinds. Some groups and acts may be informed by both rationales, and there are many more specific categories that branch off from that main pair, but all acts do seem to be simplifiable to at least one of these two concerns, and in some cases both. If this is true, it seems reasonable to guess that there may be ways to combat terrorism at its root, rather than dealing with all the poisonous thorns that grow from it once it has a chance to fully bloom. Writing past wrongs is a prickly subject, and it's one that I've spoken about in past episodes from a few different angles, and it is a difficult topic to discuss, because frankly, it's embarrassing, and it's sad, and it's something that a lot of people would prefer to sweep under the rug. In the United States, our history of slavery is an immensely uncomfortable subject, and it's something that a lot of people would prefer to relegate to the annals of history. It's a bad thing that happened, but thankfully we don't do that anymore. So let's just leave it at that. But that history still impacts and shapes the lives of many, many people who are alive today, in big ways and in small ways. It's something we don't like to talk about and address because there don't seem to be any easy solutions to these problems that it's created. But this is exactly the type of issue that is most ideally addressed, while it's still in a reasonably manageable form, lest it become something even worse due to negligence. The Irish Republican Army is an example of a similar dynamic playing out in the United Kingdom. The IRA coalesced in 1917 in response to the British demanding that the Irish enlist to fight in World War I. This led to attacks on British agents in the following years, including the events that took place on what came to be known as Bloody Sunday, the 21st of November, 1920, a day in which 14 British intelligence operatives were assassinated in Dublin followed by a mass shooting by the Royal Irish Constabulary, that is the police in Ireland, into a crowd at a soccer match, which killed 14 people and injured 65. The IRA then split with the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921, which established the Irish Free State, separate from Britain, which later became simply Ireland. And the group split because some of the members of the IRA wanted to recognize this treaty, while others wanted to keep fighting. Then came the Irish Civil War, in which the Irish Republicans and Irish Nationalists faced off with the Nationalists, supported and supplied by the British, while the Republicans continued to fight them and the British because they wanted to take and control and govern the whole island of Ireland not just the peace that was surrendered as a result of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. The group then split again a few times, mostly for political reasons. The so-called official IRA, for instance, was primarily Marxist and fought for workers' rights, and eventually became the Workers' Party of Ireland. The provisional IRA broke off from the official IRA to become a left-wing political group that disagreed with Marxism. The Continuity IRA broke off from the Provisional IRA in 1986 because the Provisional IRA came to recognize the authority of the Republic of Ireland despite wanting to have the entire island of Ireland under Irish control. And the Real IRA broke off from the Provisional IRA in 1997 and was made up of members who opposed the Northern Ireland peace process, which was a ceasefire between the local Catholics and Protestants and their associated political groups. This ceasefire brought an end to decades of mutual violence between these groups, including shootings and bombings and assassinations, which claimed the lives of over 3,500 people. But some people clearly didn't want the violence to end. It's fair to say, I think, that... 
things in Ireland have been complicated for quite some time. But the cycle of violence there, and all the spin-offs of that violence, both terrorism-related and official all-out government conflict, can be traced back to the initial conquest of the Irish people by the British government, and the subsequent centuries of abuse and violence and suppression of Irish culture at the hands of their conquerors. Now, the Britain of old is not the Britain of today. The morality of conquest and colonization back then was very different than the way that we perceive those things by contemporary standards. The dominant perception of back then was that colonizers were doing well by the local cultures to convert them and to make them civilized and to bring them into the enlightened fold. This perception that they held doesn't make their actions any less horrible, but it does help us understand that, although those actions were negative ones, they were also common and justifiable by the standards of the day. Morality changes with time, and we look back at the morality of colonialism with embarrassment bordering on horror, and this is good and right, and it shows that we can change. We'll no doubt look at much of what we do today the same way, through the eyes of future generations. And there's no way to know for certain which of our contemporary morals will fall out of favor and which new ones will emerge with time. That's how these things work. And although it's good to aspire to keep growing as moral creatures and to recognize that things will change, it's generally an exercise in futility to try to predict what will come next in that regard. Experience and time reshapes everyone eventually, and that includes entire cultures, which is all a long-winded way of saying that today's British are not conquering intolerant brutes, even if people who flew the same flag might have been at some point in their history. It's a positive thing that they have changed with the times and adjusted their actions according to their new standards of morality. But that they've changed doesn't temper the feelings and cultural memory of those who have been mistreated in the past in their name. There is still violence committed under the banner of the IRA, and there is still resentment held by many groups around the world against their former colonial oppressors, against those who stripped them of their cultural identity hundreds of years ago. And this hatred sometimes takes physical shape today much to everyone's terror. I want to make clear here that I'm only using the British as one example of this, in part because it's relevant to the article that's the focus of this episode, and in part because they were the dominant empire for a great deal of modern Western history. They played a major role in the colonial era, and they defined the shape of the modern world. And hell, the U.S., has a much shorter history than the British, and we still managed to cram a large number of incredibly morally questionable acts into a very concise national lifetime. So this is definitely not just a British thing. All around the world, any country or other group of people that has ever been dominant in a given region has made enemies by suppressing and subsuming and sequestering other groups of people. And we deal with the consequences of these past acts today. And it's unlikely that this human tradition, that this cycle, will ever end. We will continue to sow the seeds of our future enemies because, again, we can't always recognize tomorrow's moral failings today. And also because some things that make a whole lot of sense from one perspective are perceived as horrible atrocities from another. And sometimes that different perspective is achieved by changing cultures, and sometimes it's achieved by the simple passage of time. The way we deal with terrorism today is often an exercise in coping with the symptoms rather than the disease itself. As a result, we opt for a whole lot of counterviolence and restrictions on the freedoms of everyday people rather than actions that reduce the malignancy of any of these groups, or that increase the perception within these groups that they can achieve their ends through nonviolent means. I don't think there's a sunshine and rainbow solution to terrorism. I think it's naive to believe we can simply talk our way out of every conflict. And I think that in some cases, the only real option is to take out the people in charge and reduce their ability to inflict further harm. There are people who simply cannot be reasoned with. 
and there are many more who use perceived mistreatment as an excuse to grab power. This happens in the world of terrorism, but it also happens within national governments. Foot soldiers are propagandized into believing the party line, even when the leaders themselves do not. And it's those soldiers who typically suffer the consequences of violence while the leaders grab more power. That said, there does seem to be an opportunity to reduce the number of groups of this kind and the intensity of their disdain by proactively addressing historical and recent slights and crimes and by taking oppression seriously when we encounter it. This is a big ask, I know. But orienting ourselves toward these kinds of solutions allows us to not just staunch the rationales behind a lot of the violence committed by terrorist organizations. It also allows us to reinforce and morally empower our own countries and our own cultures and our own governments. It allows us to slowly but surely soften some of our past misdeeds, even if we can never take them back. That is a step in the right direction, and something we should be proud of being able to accomplish. Now that said, I recognize that it is worth asking whether or not that concept has a natural endpoint. It's possible, for instance, that we could find ourselves addressing old conflicts from prehistoric times, where one family stole a flint spearhead from another family, and the victim's descendants come to demand compensation for this ancient slight. I don't know where we would draw the line for this type of thing. Because if you go back far enough, there are few, if any, groups that have not been victims at some point in some way. History is so riddled with misdeeds that if we could become truly possessed by the desire to address and attempt to correct all past wrongs, we might never achieve anything new, much less be capable of assessing the legitimacy of many of the claims. This is an extreme worth considering. We certainly don't want to live in the past and dwell on history instead of the present and future. But it would be beneficial, I think, to make sure we're able to live in a world in which past crimes can be healthily set aside, in which they have been rectified in some way. And part of making that happen will be ensuring that we all start out with the same advantages and the same access to resources and opportunities. Until we're able to make that a reality, it's very likely that we'll continue to look backward and feel bruised by the things that have happened before, generations ago, and that we will continue to suspect that these things have influenced the world we live in today and what we do and do not have. And in some cases, those suspicions will be right. This process, whatever the specifics of it might be, starts with being able to view these attacks from the big picture perspective which is a difficult perspective to achieve when we're emotionally engaged and riled up by politicians and cable news talking heads and angry Facebook posts from friends and relatives. There are many possible paths we might take that will work better than those to which we currently default, and we're most likely to choose the most ideal path if we can bring ourselves to think broadly and clearly and assess the situation from a psychological distance with an open mind and emotional stability. The British response to this most recent attack, I think, is a step in the right direction in that regard. It's a model that won't always be feasible or applicable or even desirable, depending on the circumstances, but it reinforces the idea of going about one's day, not panicking or changing one's routine because some violent person wants you to, and of keeping calm, of reminding ourselves of what we're protecting in the first place. That to me seems like a very good position from which to start thinking about possible solutions. You can find the show notes for this episode and every episode at letsknowthings.com. While there, you can sign up for the Let's Know Things newsletter, which goes out every Monday and contains a collection of links to interesting things you can also click through to the contribute page to find a bunch of different ways that you can help support the show. One way that you can help support this podcast and my work in general is to check out my new book, Becoming Who We Need to Be, which hits shelves and e-shelves on May 1st, 2017. When this episode first drops, that means it will be available for pre-order. And you may listen to this in the future and it may already be available. 
Picking up that book and then leaving a review if you enjoy it are two great ways that you can help support the show and my work in general. If you enjoy this podcast, chances are you will enjoy the subject matter and the style of that book. Another great way to help support the show is to check out our sponsors, the first of which is Audible. I love the hell out of audiobooks, and typically I, I listen to great big long ones. I love nonfiction in particular when it comes to audiobooks. But today I want to recommend a short piece of fiction, like ultra short, eight minutes short. And this short story is by Andy Weir. It is called The Egg. And Andy Weir's name might sound familiar. He wrote the immensely popular book, The Martian. And this was a short story that he wrote before The Martian, I believe. And it starts out in a really compelling way. Quote, You were on your way home when you died. It was a car accident. Nothing particularly remarkable, but fatal nonetheless. You left behind a wife and two children. It was a painless death. The EMTs tried their best to save you, but to no avail. Your body was so utterly shattered, you were better off. Trust me. And that's when you met me. End quote. You can get The Egg or many other works, many of which are a whole lot longer and perhaps a better use of your credit, but it's an option if you want it. If you go to audibletrial.com LKT, you can get that for free. Or you can use the credit that they give you by going to that URL on any book in their massive collection, including the works that I have up there, or any of the other books that I've mentioned during this segment on this show. If you look around, you can also find that work, The Egg, to read in non-audible format for free. So it's definitely worth checking out whether or not you choose to go the audible or audio route in general. And while I'm talking about it, if you haven't read The Martian, Andy Weir's other work, it is definitely worth your time. And that is on Audible, I'm almost certain, as well. So if you want that free credit and to help support the show, go to audibletrial.com LKT. And then the other sponsor today is HostGator, the hosting company that I use for all of my online projects. If you go to hostgator.com LKT, you will receive the substantial discount that they give to listeners of Let's Know Things hostgator.com slash LKT. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can check out the show notes to this episode and every episode at letsnotethings.com. You can read my blog at exilelifestyle.com. And you can find me pretty much everywhere on the internet at Colin is my name. Thank you so much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.